Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is shamanic physics, and with me in the studio is Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, physicist, shaman, and author of six books, including Space, Time, and Beyond, Taking the Quantum Leap, which won the American Book Award in Science, Parallel Universes, The Body Quantum, and most recently, The Eagle's Quest. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here again. It's a pleasure to be with you and, and to reflect on all the many years I've known you and the adventures that you have been involved in. I, your exploration into the world of mysticism and, and shamanism began well over 20 years ago, I think, when, when you first started studying Kabbalah in that's, Paris. That's true. That's true. That was the beginning of all this. Uh, new stuff and this kind of uh, crazy, uh, I, I don't know if we should call it crazy these days because everything we, everything we were working on, I was working on in the, in the early 70s, seems to now be coming true. We were predicting all kinds of things in like space, time and beyond about, for example, the physics of time travel. And right now, there are papers coming out in the Physical Review, which is a top echelon journal about how to build a time machine today. So it's... Uh, it's, a, it's really, in a sense, a new, a new age, and we're beginning something very exciting in the 20th century. Well, it's interesting to me that you, a classically trained physicist, a former professor of physics at San Diego State University, has come around full circle, in a sense, to embrace the, the world, the ancient, ancient worldview of shamanism. Yes, it's a, it is a kind of a surprise in a way. Uh, shamanism, or shamanism, uh, there's a lot of different ways of pronouncing mm -hmm. it, is something which can be dated, I think, fairly accurately to about a period of 30,000 years. And here we are in the field of new physics, quantum physics, and uh, finding some very similar truths, things that the shamans observed about the nature of reality, seem to be things that we as physicists are also beginning to observe about reality. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a rather exciting time, and I'm uh, really pleased to have been able to participate in this kind of world, and I'm uh, looking forward to more adventures in it. Yeah. I mentioned a moment ago, and I'd like just to define for our viewers, uh, Kabbalah. Yes. Since that was one of your introductions to the world of, of magic, could you define it and talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um, Kabbalah is actually a Hebrew word, and it's the, it means to receive. So if you happen to be, say, in Israel, and you want to get a receipt for a meal, you say, Kabbalah Bavakasha, which means, may I please may I have my receipt. Mm. So Kabbalah is the act of receiving, and it's a very uh, ancient mystical uh, form, spiritual form, that uh, uh, originally began with the study of uh, sacred uh, texts in the original Hebrew language. Uh, the Kabbalists believed, for example, that there were sacred sounds and uh, that if you pronounce these sounds, you could evoke... Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, each, each letter is, 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 has its own meaning, but each letter, being a word, can be spelled in terms of other letters. So it's a constant, uh, it's a generation of infinity, because, for example, if you spell the meaning of what each letter, uh, of, what, of what each single letter stands for in terms of the whole. So it's almost holographic. Uh, the part contains the whole, literally, in, mm -hmm. in the... In, the, in, 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 in these actual sounds. And as I understand it, when you look at, uh, for example, in the book of Genesis, the story of creation, mm -hmm. and read it from this Kabbalistic perspective, you get a vision of the creation that's not so different than the one you might find in physics. Uh, basically, that, that's, that's true. Uh, <coughs> the Kabbalists have a symbol for creation. It's bait, the second letter of the Hebrew Aleph bait. Um, and we're, uh, alphabet comes from Olive Bait, obviously, um, and it means uh, it means uh, several m several meanings, which are all related. It means a container. It also means a house. That's where you know temples are called Bait or Beth something. That Beth is another pronunciation of Bait. Uh, but it also means uh, in the Tarot system, it means the magician, uh, that which creates. So it has a creative element in it. 
But the secret of creation is containment. So in order to create something, you have to contain something from something else. You have to make a distinction. I think uh, G. Spencer Brown wrote about the first distinction. So in a way, uh, Kabbalah is indicating how things are created from nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the principles that you have developed linking your background in physics, your work as a physicist mm -hmm. with the, the work of mystics and, and shamans is that all of, all of you are concerned with vibration. Yes. Yes, right. Um, like the sound of these words of power are vibrations. Yes, in fact, um, the idea of vibration as being a major facet to uh, not only the ancient Kabbalists' view, but also the shamanic view, was something I, I've, I discovered and then discovered again. Um, my teacher, Carlos Suarez, in Paris, when I was living in Paris, had taught me about this, and that was back in 1974, and then it rekindled uh, in 1989 uh, after spending time with the Peruvian shamans. Um, I remember the first time I met uh, Jorge Gonzalez Ramirez, who is a uh, Peruvian shaman, and uh, I asked him simple questions like, well, how do you heal somebody? And uh, then I said, well, before I, I, you, I, you, you answer that question, I said, how do you know when someone's sick? And he says, oh, it's, I can tell by their vibration. I said, oh, their vibration. Uh, well, how do you do that? And so then he reaches over, and just like I'm reaching over, he grabs my wrist and he starts holding my wrist like this. And then I said, oh, and you know, I'm thinking, oh, this guy is you know, maybe primitive. And You mean pulse, that's what you mean, you mean pulse. And then he says, that too. And then I realized that when he's speaking about vibrations or bodily vibrations, he's not just speaking about the pulse, but he's speaking about a number of different vibrational energies that are present in the body. Well, after I talked with him and then had an experience with him in which I directly felt his vibration in a, in a shamanic trance state that I mm -hmm. entered with him, uh, I then had talked, to be, even before and afterwards, I had talked with a number of other shamans in different parts of the world, uh, Anglo-Saxon shamans, Druids. Uh, I talked with shamans uh, from different Indian tribes, the Chumash <coughs> Indians down in uh, Ventura, California, also the Ogallala Sioux in South Dakota. And they all keyed me into the idea that vibration was extremely important in their worldview. So when I wrote the book, The Eagle's Quest, I decided that in order for me as a physicist to make sense out of all of this, I'm, I'm really going to have to approach it from a, as much of a scientific viewpoint as I can. So I made up a series of postulates or hypotheses. And the first hypothesis, the major one, is that the shamans see the universe in, as made of primal vibrational stuff. And that really tied into my understanding of quantum physics, because in quantum physics we talk about quantum waves, which are vibrations, out of which all matter is eventually, uh, e eventually is created or emerges. Yeah. So uh, there was a direct tie-in right there. Uh -huh. And these quantum waves, as I understand them, are non-physical in the sense that they are probability waves. Exactly right. And it's very similar to the shamanic uh, idea. Uh, quantum physics is a very bizarre business. I mean, it's uh, the business of business, and nothing could be further from our normal sense of reality than that business. Yeah. It deals uh, with, uh, with things which are, in a sense, unobservable, out of which we feel all observable phenomena ar will arise or arises. And one of the basic assumptions about, of quantum physics is the quantum wave nature of all matter. That matter, uh, unobserved, matter on its own, uh, moves and vibrates in, in, in waves. But waves of what? Are they water waves? Are they sound waves? Are they electrical waves? No, they're actually waves of nothing. They're, uh, they, they're, they're called probability waves. And probability is something that you do in your brain, in your mind. You think. You need to determine what's probable and what's not probable. So we're dealing with something which is akin to almost mind stuff, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, this is not really too much of a surprise. Physicists already had a shock to their system delivered in 1905 when Einstein uh, pointed out that there was no ether to support waves of light. So when a light wave is waving, what is it waving in? It's also waving in nothing. So light is a kind of a halfway between material and energetic reality that we see in terms of substance and almost uh, the mind of God, if you will. Yeah. One of your other hypotheses is that shamans work with the realm of, of mythos, of, yes. of myths and legends. And I get a sense that this 
quantum probability waving around in nothingness could very well be the same stuff of myths. Uh, in fact, I would suggest, although I imagine uh, some scientists might find this more difficult to accept, that it is a kind of a myth. Um, we have myths about subatomic reality. Uh, there isn't anybody alive who's ever seen a subatomic particle. Uh, that it captured one and held one in their hands or, or put one in a, in a bottle and examined it. Um, and quantum waves are something like this. In fact, I would suggest that what scientists do is to create myths that they can substantiate through the process of mathematics and through the process of observation. Mm -hmm. But what they observe and what they believe is creating what they observe are often quite separate from each other. So, in a certain sense, mm -hmm. quantum physics is a, is a myth that uh, Western culture lives mm -hmm. by. It, what I think I hear you saying is that there's a process of reification going on, that the quantum physicists set up their experiments in a certain way to create these results, and then they say, ah, this is the objective world out there. Exactly. And not always acknowledging their role in creating it. Exactly. It's, uh, the, the original uh, spirit of science, which I think uh, begins almost with Sir Francis Bacon, is the notion that there is such a thing as an objective world. And probably if we look back through history, we can see the concept arising in the early Greeks, uh, maybe with Democritus and the notion of that there were atoms of stuff which were fundamental. Um, and the idea of an objective reality was somehow to separate or remove uh, the, the human brain or the mind from this objective reality. So somehow we had the idea that an observer observed what was already out there. But in the quantum realm, when you set up an experiment, you're not just observing what's already out there, you're participating with what's out there. And in a sense, you are actually creating your experience of what's happening out there. So if you look for certain phenomena one way, you see phenomena in that way. If you look for it in another way, you see it in a contradictory guise. The so-called wave-particle duality is an example of this, or the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty, the position and momentum of an object is another example of this. Uh -huh. Well, would you say that the various uh, shamans that you worked with in different cultures, each with their own mythological system, are doing something much the same? I would say there is a, a very strong tie-in here. Um, shamans, for example, deal in a world of spirits. Um, they, uh, they deal in uh, mythological connections between events. Uh, they're in a world that Jung would call a world of synchronicity. Uh, for example, uh, in China, if a shaman is going to heal you, and on that particular day when the shaman is coming to you, he notices a bird flying north to south or east to west, that will affect your healing. In other words, that's a message to him about what type of healing you need to undergo. Mm -hmm. So the shamans are, are constantly dealing with, uh, uh, I, I would say, synch synchronicities and mythical elements. Uh, a bird doesn't just mean a bird, it means something having to do with flight, or it may have something to do with the dead spirit that's flown. Um, and uh, because of their belief structure in this, uh, as much as our scientific belief structure in things like particles, they uh, see the world differently. Uh, Western scientists uh, see the world uh, in a certain way. Uh, we, all, we have jokes about, uh, well, don't mind him, he's just a physicist or something like that because physicists seem to be so quirky about trying to analyze everything and see everything in terms of separate parts. Uh, well, this is a, a penchant, a, a, way, or a way of seeing that physicists, physicists have developed as a result of their training. In a very similar way, uh, shamans have developed a way of seeing because of their training. And their training is actually longer in time mm -hmm. than the training of a physicist. So um, they indeed uh, are able to see things or have belief structures about things which, which lie, I would say, outside of the realm of the Western scientists. Mm -hmm. now, one of the intriguing things about uh, shamanism, shamanism, is the idea of the call to be a shaman. That yes. Some people are called. And in your writing, you suggest that in some sense, this call has affected you. You haven't just been an objective physicist looking into the world of, of shamanism. You actually ha have been kind of pulled in, even yanked in from time to time. More or less. Uh, the way shamans heal or the way they, they relate to other people is to initiate them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you hang out with them enough time, 
you begin to learn from them and in fact in order for you to communicate with them at a certain level you have to transform you have to undergo some kind of process so all the basic healing rituals everything you do is is an initiation procedure that the shaman himself has gone through uh... so i think this is very important because it helps us to understand uh... why in some cases they're successful in healing and in other cases they're not uh, a lot have to do with the belief structure of the being who is undergoing the healing and uh... i i use a model uh... i i, I use a vibrational model to try to explain this uh... it's a model based upon pendula you know that's two pendulums hmm. um, if if you have two pendula you know what they are they're little bobs ha hanging by sticks from some uh, uh, support point and they and they swing back and forth well you can imagine that you might have two pendula of different lengths and between the two uh, sticks holding the bobs there might be a, a a very lightweight spring of some kind so that you can virtually move one and the spring will move but it uh, it won't uh, it won't uh, cause everything to shake up uh, in, in any kind of bizarre or or, or uh, 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 unsure way uh, and you can imagine that you might start shaking the uh, the bottom pendulum, which is which is long. And as you know, uh, as maybe you know, uh, maybe the audience knows, uh, if pendulums have different lengths, they vibrate at different rates. Yeah. The short pendulum vibrates uh, actually faster than the longer pendulum. Mm -hmm. So if you start the long one going and you try to uh, see what happens, uh, well, the long one starts to go, and the spring starts to expand and contract, and it should start the short one going, but. The short one has a different rate that it wants to go at. Different so rhythms, consequently, yeah. they're out of rhythm, they're out of mm -hmm. sync, they're out of uh, vibrational resonance with each other. And uh, so very little energy gets transferred. All the little one does is just shake around a little bit, but it doesn't really gain any energy. But if they're both the same length, and you start this one going, and then what starts to happen is that this one starts, to, the one on the right starts to slow down, and the one on the left starts to speed up, and energy gets transferred from one to the mm -hmm. other, and then back again. So there's a real resonance or a vibrational transfer. So I, I said that this is maybe, uh, this resembles some way, in some way, the way shamans actually heal. Uh, when I come into the shamanic uh, world, I'm not at the same length uh, as they are. They have a certain vibration. What they want to do with me is initiate me so that I can become resonant with them. And at that point, then whatever illness I have can be transferred over to them. Now, the, what's interesting about them is they're able to get rid of illness. They can shake it off or they get rid of it in their normal bodily functions. Yeah. And uh, I think this is a, 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 an important uh, insight into how they actually heal. In, in other words, they resonate with you, take on your illness, and then because they know how to heal themselves, That's right. they can get rid of it. They That's can right. handle your illness better than you can. That's right. That's basically what they do. Mm -hmm. um, Don Salone, a very powerful shaman that I met in Peru, who was seven years old, a maestral shaman, um, would, uh, would, would heal in, in ways that uh, were all, almost unfathomable to me. One, one way of healing or adjusting, getting my vibration to change, would be to make me get sicker. Uh, he he would uh, blow uh, this very obnoxious tobacco smoke all over me, and then I would throw up or or sweat or something. And as a result of that, I would be getting rid of whatever particular illness that was bothering me. And at the time, uh, because I had traveled through many different time zones and had gone from uh, the weather patterns that were at that time I was living in New Mexico to the jungle patterns, which are very hot and humid. Uh, I, I, whenever mm -hmm. I go through a weather change, I suffer from sinus, chronic sinus headaches. So I was getting headaches a lot of the time, and he could heal those by just uh, doing the ceremony with me. Uh -huh. And he would heal them in a very bizarre way. In fact, uh, I can't imagine any Western doctor doing this. But one, one of the ways they do it is they spit on you. <laughs> And another thing they do is that they actually uh, they actually apply their lips to whatever. Uh, like for example, if I have a headache, they would, he would apply his lips to my head and actually apply suction with his mouth mm -hmm. and 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 suck the headache away. And uh, one time he did this. Uh, in fact, the time I had a real splitting headache, it was gone and like that. I mean, he just sucked it gone. It was gone. It just vanished like real, real quickly. Well, there's a real intimate quality to this work. It's, it's very carnal in a sense isn't <laughs> it's it? very it's meat mm -hmm. it's very meat all the way uh, it's definitely carnal it's definitely moist it's earthy it's uh, it's feminine uh, it's uh, it's hands-on stuff 
Uh, it's a uh, very mothering, a very loving uh, kind of energy. And uh, for me to experience not only the shamans, but also the Amazon, the Amazon jungle and the Amazon river, uh, it was all a nurturing thing. The jungle is like some, I mean, you, you have a feeling about the jungle, and I remember my feelings. Uh, you, you can't quite love it, and you can't hate it either because it's so powerful, and yet it's fragile. Uh, it can be wiped out very easily. Just cut down a few trees, and it, it can turn into a desert. So it's both fragile and powerful at the same time, and all life grows there. It's like a womb. Uh, it's very alive. It's verdant. Um, I was amazed at the different sounds of life that I could hear as I would fall asleep in my jungle hut. Uh, it was an incredible, enriching, enriching mm -hmm. experience. Uh, and the shamans come from that come from that uh, particular tradition. And the Peruvian shamans heal according to the environment they're in. If you go to other parts of the world, maybe drier parts of the world, there's a different shamanic tradition. I would even suggest that uh, uh, the ancient tribal people of Israel, the Israeli tribes, were shamanic. And they probably used desert rituals, which mm -hmm. were very different, say, for example, than uh, the rituals of the jungle. And many of our uh, modern religions have developed mystical, magical practices based on the original cultures from whence they came. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting thing that uh, uh, two Anglo-Saxon shamans taught me when I had visited them. Um, a very bizarre thing happened to me. Uh, one of my friends, uh, who you probably know, Ralph Blum, you probably had oh, him yes. on your show. Sure. Um, uh, Ralph, uh, just before I was going to Mexico uh, to do some, uh, to, to live there and do some work on my book, Parallel Universes, I was very concerned about uh, getting into that magical religious world, and I was a little bit frightened of it. I was actually a little afraid of Mexico. And um, so I asked Ralph, well, what can I use to protect me? And uh, he said, here, take this. And he gave me a uh, crystal with a rune on it, mm -hmm. a rune character. And I put it on my neck and I wore it, and I thought, oh, I'm protected. Ralph is protecting me. So I get down to Mexico, and the night before we were leaving Mexico City to uh, take the blue train into San Miguel de Allende, where we were going to live, um, I had, uh, for some reason, I, taken it, take, I took the, the whole thing off and put it on the nightstand next to my bed. Mm -hmm. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard a large sound like, Bop! whoa, what was that? And it woke me up. And I kind of reasoned, well, my ruin, my, my crystal must have fallen off the nightstand. So I didn't think anything, anything else about it. The next morning, I got up. We were packing to get ready. I looked under the nightstand, not even remembering that it, fell, that it actually had fallen off. Couldn't find any, anything. I always check under beds, under nightstands, mm -hmm. whenever I, because I travel a lot, to see if I've left anything. I mm -hmm. usually find something. There was nothing there. So we left, and we were on the train, and halfway there, and suddenly I realized I lost this thing. Your protection. My protection. I thought, my God, what's going on here? Well. Two years later, I'm now with the Anglo-Saxon shamans, and I re repeated the story to them. I said, what, what's that all about? What, why did this thing sort of like pop and vanish? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what, It lost it itself, in other words. In a way. He says it was a good thing that happened. He says, because this is a Norse symbol of magic, right. and Norse magic doesn't work in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, things circulate differently there. And uh, it was good for you that that wasn't there. And in fact, they were talking about people who, misguided though they were, were taking crystals from different parts of, uh, of other continents even and implanting them around uh, Stonehenge mm -hmm. to enrich it in some way. Well, what's happened since then is rather, rather remarkable. Stonehenge has now been screened by a, uh, a great big fence and people can't just walk into it anymore. The Druids can't even do their ceremonies there anymore, so it's like, they really changed the whole the energy, energy. Of, that, of that place. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's something to this. I mean, uh, there's something to uh, little things having some kind of resonant effect even in the ground. And crystals do vibrate. And uh, it's very possible that there's some kind of vibrational entrainment mm -hmm. that throws things off and makes people feel ill at ease when uh, mm -hmm. you have something like, like this going, going yeah. on. Well, one of the other points you make is that shamans, shamans will do anything to affect your belief system, yes. whatever they can do, because they need to work with that to, yes. in, in the resonance. So in a way, it's kind of funny. It's like, how do you know that any of these principles are in any sense objective? Yes. Uh, this, is, this was the, the most difficult thing I had to come to. Um, 
First of all, l let me address that point, and then I will address the, uh, uh, the, the difficulty that I was having uh, coming into the shamanic world in terms of my objectivity yeah, as a scientist. Yeah, we just have a couple minutes now. Okay. But the first point is that shamans are like tricksters, and they will, uh, they will uh, use uh, conjuring magic to convince you uh, that you need to change your ways in order for them to work with you. So if you're overlooking this and watching it, it looks, you know, you can say, well, he's, this is an obvious trick. He's not really pulling something out of the guy's stomach. But it depends on, but what's important is what does the person who's having this happen to him believe? What do they believe? Sure. And uh, in terms of objectivity, in terms of my experience with the shamans. If it's your stomach, you may feel. You might feel differently. Yeah. But in terms of my own experience with them, I found there was no way I could look at these guys or examine them as Joe Friday, just collecting the facts, ma'am. I had to really get involved. And that meant I became a participant. In a way, I entered a quantum reality with them. There was no way I could just observe them without myself being observed by myself. And that is something that is magical and wonderful and taught me an awful lot about who I am and what my mythos is and what's, ru what's running this, yeah. this being as it goes through the life process. Well, there's so many levels of complexity. On the one hand, we have the, the mutual sharing of vibrations. On the other hand, we have you know, the breaking down and creation of new structures of belief systems. And you just mentioned the whole notion of parallel universes, which right. is so important in shamanism. Yes, uh, the, uh, the shamans are able to enter into, uh, into other levels of reality uh, which are parallel to our own. Um, they can do parallel physical reality things I don't, uh, uh, and, and appear in different places at the uh -huh. same time. Uh, and uh, I mean, I didn't see this personally, but they told me they were able to do it. But they also are able to enter to the death realm in which yeah. they can actually see living spirit, uh, dead spirits coming alive. Such a rich and deep topic, Fred, but our time has run out. Thanks so much for being with me, Fred Allen Wolf. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was a real pleasure. And thank you for being with us.